We started the company three years ago, and uh, from this point, we have been helping lenders of any kind, um, also insurance companies, telcos, e-commerce providers, move to the digital age that uh, they should belong to. And namely, um, we have been struggling with or, or hoping to solve or, or planning to solve two issues, uh, which you here have seen as well and, and have been discussed already today many times. One of these issues is um, how to attract and then how to serve the next generation of buyers, um, how to lend them money. These are essentially the millennials that have been mentioned so many times. It's people between 18 and 33 years of age, hence including myself as well. But uh, there are so many such people out there, an estimated 15 million in the UK, another 83 million in the States, and much more all over the world. So that's one segment that is a huge challenge to most lenders all around the world. They don't know how to deal with this segment. And the second segment that is a huge challenge is the non-prime underbanked customers. Around 8 million such people here in UK, 64 in, in the States. So it's a huge segment. So, of course, there is an overlap between those, those two groups, but still, huge number of people, um, which is a challenge to most lenders around the world. And it is a challenge because the way, we, the way lenders approach credit scoring, the way lenders approach these client segments, hasn't actually changed a lot in the past 20 years. So when somebody applies for a loan today, then the decision whether to issue the loan, whether to sell the car, is still based on the information that this person provides in writing, on paper, or in the online loan application. That's one. And second, the information that you can get from the credit bureau, like Experian here, for example. And that's pretty much all we have, or all we have had so far, for making the decision for issuing the credit. Now, the world has changed in the past 20 years. And as a result, the sources of information that can be theoretically used for credit scoring have expanded uh, considerably. What we are today using in credit scoring is, is a lot more than just those two uh, traditional sources. So we are plugging into all kinds of various online places that we possibly uh, can. There is so much information out there. And what I'm going to show you now is, I mean, big data is a, is a buzzword. Um, I've heard it so many times already that, that I, I already hate it. And then I remember it's in our company name. Um, but I mean, big data is something that everybody talks about, but nobody really understands what it is. So I'm going to show you a few sources of data that we work with, how do we work with, and, and, and hopefully show a, a kind of a, an actual part of the big data world then. The world around us has changed a lot in a sense that people now spend a tremendous amount of in, uh, time in internet. Uh, if we look at the millennial segment, young people, uh, then on average, globally, six hours every day is spent on internet. Various online channels, um, Instagram, social networks, Google Media, YouTube, pretty much everything. And during these six hours people spend on internet every day, um, pretty much everything gets recorded um, in one way or another. Everything leaves a trace that can be used uh, theoretically in credit scoring that we have been doing and, and, and showing that can be done. So let's take an example. Um, this guy wants to buy a car. Um, I, I kind of thought this might be a typical young chap today. Studied abroad, doesn't use a credit card. Uh, hence has no credit history. No student loan either. Um, he's a big fan of Apple Pay. So no track record of of kind of standard banking history. Um, irregular income, doesn't work uh, at one large corporation, and no mortgage. Um, for any regular scoring service, it would be quite difficult to understand or assess 
the creditworthiness of this guy. But what we know is that this guy has a blog. Um, he's a fan of social media. He's a freelance designer. So all, although he's not employed, he actually makes tons of money because he's, he's a good designer. Um, this guy loves his smartphone so much that he spends more than six hours a day looking at the smartphone and has tons of friends. And friends tell a lot about a person. So I'm going to show you how we might analyze, uh, for credit scoring purposes, a guy like him, and then what effect it might have, uh, or actually what we've seen, the effect that it has for lenders. We plug into various sources of data, like I said. Um, first, which is social media. Um, pretty much everyone has a Facebook profile these days. And we have been collecting Facebook profiles for people for more than three years now. At the same time, we also have been collecting information about the payment behavior of the same people. So we have been able to find out the patterns and correlations uh, that might indicate a bad or a good payment behavior. So for example, people who have indicated their relationship status in Facebook um, are on average, statistically speaking, more likely to default on the loan. Um, <laughs> people who spend way too much time in Facebook are on average uh, worse clients for banks. People who like and comment absolutely everything that shows up on their wall are on average worse clients for their banks. So these are just a few examples. From a single Facebook profile, we can download up to 10,000 points of data on average. And of course, most of that is nice. Um, on, on one slide that Brendan showed, uh, Zest Finance was claiming to be analyzing 70,000 points of data. That's crap. Uh, most of this is noise. Uh, most of this is something that we don't understand. But from this huge pile of noise, there are certain indicators that have stood up in the, in the analysis that we've been doing for, for years now. Um, so social media, a very rich data source, and, and uh, reveals a lot about the person that you're dealing with. Second, um, we go through pretty much everything that we can find from public internet. Um, and what becomes more popular nowadays are the sites where freelancers can register themselves and then uh, offer to do a task or, or, or two. This guy, for example, as well, um, might be registered at, at, at such a site. So while the standard credit application might say that this guy is unemployed, and uh, the traditional credit bureau so services might say the same thing, then we actually know that this guy is a freelancer um, and then doing a great job in Upwork, for example. Um, so there's, there's a lot hidden in the, in the public internet. Third, um, what has proven to be an exceptionally good source of information for people um, is their behavior on the lender's website. So if somebody is applying for a loan or any other credit product through an online channel, then what people don't realize is that they are being tracked or they can be tracked from the point they arrive on this web page. And that's what we do. Um, one, it helps to identify fraud, which was discussed earlier. There are ways how robots actually or usually work on a website. And then there are ways how a natural person moves on a website. But in addition to the fraud detection, there is a lot more into it. Uh, in terms of credit um, worthiness, we have, for example, seen that on some markets, people who spend enough time on the terms and condition page and also look at the price list before applying for a loan are, on average, better clients for the banks. Uh, people who don't look at the terms, people who don't care about the prices, people who go straight to filling in the loan application itself, on average, default at a higher rate. Also, we are able to track how people actually landed on your website. Um, for example, if they came through Google, uh, what keyword was used for the search? If somebody is searching for um, quick credit, bad credit history, then we actually know what the keyword was 
and can use this in the scoring model. And of course, our patterns have shown up that people who use this type of keywords on average default a lot more. Consumers, on the other hand, they don't even realize that credit scoring started even before they landed on the web page, and hence they kind of felt free to do whatever they wanted to. Um, also, we can track how people are filling in the actual loan application, how fast they type, um, how much copy and paste is there. Um, we've seen people who copy and paste everything are extremely likely to default because it's quite likely that you are one of a hundred applications they're filling in at the same time. And there's a lot more that can be recorded and, and, and what we use in credit scoring today. Uh, fourth, um, we can, of course, record what type of device is being used for applying for this loan. Whether it's a new smartphone, old PC, or something in between, um, a mark gets left behind. And if you have sufficient amount of data, then you can see the patterns in this information as well. You, you see whether people who have old computers are more likely to default, or the ones who are constantly upgrading to the last version of iPhone. So what type of people are they? Uh, and, and, and what it tells about them. In addition to these online sources and kind of the technical type of information, um, there's a lot more about us um, in the old school databases as well. Um, databases hosted by government or any other public entities. So uh, depends a bit on the market, but we are um, tapping into these databases as well. So to use all the kind of old school data as well. What, what we have been doing even, um, some of these databases, for example, yellow pages that we're using, still come on CDs. So we actually had to buy CDs and then upload what we had to our cloud environment to, ha to have it there. So some of the old data can be used in the new information age as well. What is a what is an extremely good source of information is also the location, so um, location in, in, in many ways. When people apply for a credit product, um, on one hand, they most likely indicate where they live, so the home address. But on the other hand, when they're filling in the loan application online, we also get to know where this, ex where this device is being, uh, where this device is located at the point of application. So first we get to compare where the person claims to be living and where the application is being filled in, but also we have the ability to analyze what the neighborhood looks like. So who are the people that on average live there? Um, up to the point that we, we actually know how many park benches and our ATMs are within two, five or 10 kilometers from the home. And um, although the, the, the entire locational analysis is statistically speaking very complicated, then um, quite early on what we, for example, discovered was that people who have many park, park benches near their home uh, are on average better clients for banks. And uh, this happened over and over and over again, and eventually we started looking into the issue because, as was said, there is little causality in, in the big data analysis. But what we discovered was that people who had many benches near their home um, usually lived near a big park. So in London, it would mean people who live uh, near Hyde Park, for example, and of course, property prices in these fields uh, were a lot more expensive and hence the better credit quality as well. And uh, also what's quite common sense but not used in credit scoring is, is the public web search. If, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room has Googled themselves at some point and then either been happy or not so happy with the results, but uh, this is something that is rarely used in uh, credit issuance. It's used a lot when you hire somebody. When, when you're recruiting, then I'm sure you Google all the candi candidates. Uh, you go through their LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, whatever you can find. When issuing credit, you can't do it because you might have 10,000 applications a day or, th or, or 100,000 applications a day. And hence, we have uh, developed algorithms that do this kind of searches automatically and know how to work with the unstructured results that show up. So all in all, um, the amount of information that we collect and then based on that predict one's behavior in terms of credit payments um, 
has had two types of effects um, on our clients. Our clients are banks, insurance companies, and so forth. So while a balance sheet, or not, not exactly a balance sheet, but a credit portfolio of a bank might look like this at the moment, there is a performing part, then inaccurately declined loan decisions. So it's, for example, the millennials, who were actually good clients, but since banks didn't have enough information, they declined the loan applications. So it's lost business opportunity there. And of course, then there is the credit loss uh, segment as well. Um, with the addition of big data on this um, portfolio, we see that on one hand, less applications are declined inaccurately. Hence, the portfolio itself becomes bigger. And also, the amount of credit losses is lower. And I'm going to show you a few examples now uh, with actual numbers as well, because that's, that's what I promised. Um, the biggest effect, uh, as I said, we, we are able to bring to the non-prime client segment, uh, because prime clients are quite easy to assess anyway. Uh, so non-prime and, and millennials, and for this purpose I chose an example from a non-bank consumer lender operating in Central Eastern Europe. Um, before using our solution, they had a credit loss rate of around 7.5%, so obviously a non-prime segment. Uh, with the help of uh, our scoring, uh, they managed to get it down to 4.9%, and at the same time uh, increased the loan acceptance rate as well. Um, so the effect here on the credit losses was around 34%. Um, overall, what we've seen um, working with some of the largest banks in the world as well, um, when our scoring is applied on top of what banks are doing today already, then the improvement is around 20 to 25% um, in the uh, predictive power of the in-house models. So we are not uh, currently in a stage, or big data itself isn't currently in a stage where we um, would be looking to replace any of the old ways of, of doing things. So we still urge banks to look for credit bureau checks and, and, and uh, ask people to fill in the loan, loan application. But uh, we are introducing a third source of information on top of that, a source of information that is too valuable and big to be ignored uh, in the future. So that's one example. Um, second example, uh, we've shown that we can also work with clients or uh, people who are not applying for loan uh, through the online channels. Because although we don't get to know what is the device that was being used for the application, we don't know where this device is located. Uh, we still know who these people are, and hence we can do all the uh, data collection from the online channels that we usually do. So although the effect is a bit smaller, uh, it's still significant. So um, seems like my presentation put the whole thing back in the schedule. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, I guess there's some room for questions, and uh, thank you. <laughs>